Oh, good morning and welcome to Sunday much. mornings at the Marxist Library. But hey, we're no longer at the Marxist Library due to the COVID pandemic. We're on Zoom and that gives us a great deal more reach. So we say good morning, good afternoon. And to those of you and even far f- further away, like Mehmet in Turkey right now, we say Good evening. And there are even more exotic places that we can reach with Zoom. Um, We note that there's a number of comrades from Texas even on this particular (laughs) show. And um, this program is brought to you by the Institute for Critical Studies. And we have been critical, excuse me, Institute for the Critical Studies of Society. And we have been doing these programs for over a decade and a half, every weekend, every Sunday morning. morning. And we're very proud of the um, way we do these things. Um, We have consciously, and I hope successfully, cultivated a culture of mutual respect and the understanding that we do not necessarily agree on all matters. But this is a comradely forum a forum for political discourse and debate, and the opinions expressed on those of the participants, and they don't necessarily represent the group consensus. However, we are united. That is the program committee that has been putting on these programs for a decade and a half with our respect for the work of Karl Marx. And we believe that work remains relevant today, not just Karl Marx, but the working class tradition of Karl Marx remains relevant today. Um, And we celebrate Marx's very famous quote from the 11th thesis on Feuerbach, that philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways. The point, however, is to change it. And our speaker today, Jerry Congdon, lives that saying. Jerry is not a newcomer to the library, actually. I've never, um, I only met Jerry once, and that was almost a year ago, excuse me, three years ago today. It was on um, August 5th, 5th, if you remember, Jerry. Um, Jerry had come up to the library, and he came up here in his capacity as the president of Veterans for Peace. And the speaker was another member of Veterans for Peace. It was Camilo Camilo Mejia. And Camilo had flown in from Miami to speak on the U.S.-backed coup attempt in Nicaragua um, that was going on um, earlier that year in April. And this was in, in, in August. And the... We expected, and in fact, we were not disappointed in our expectation, unfortunately, um, that there'd be counter demonstrators. There would be some of the Contras, the former Contras who were the U.S. mercenaries that fought against the Sandinista Revolution. And out, so that outside the library, the library had the largest um, group of people we've ever had. It was standing room only. But outside, there were the people that were demonstrating and they were quite aggressive. They were the Contras, the friends of the Contras. And then there were people who had become mouthing the same line as the Contras. That is the same line as the U.S. imperialists were that Ortega must go. And Jerry was very bravely and his comrades um, did some security for us, which we absolutely needed because the, the, the group outside got quite de- quite dangerous. Um, Jerry has spent his life as a peace activist, and um, we'll be, I'm looking very much forward to Jerry's program because it'll tell us somewhat about his background, but also the background of the struggles of people in Nicaragua to make a better world. So Jerry, why don't you take over, please? Okay, thank you, Roger. And thanks to the Marxist Library for inviting me to speak with you at this time. I am not an expert on the Nicaraguan Revolution, but I have had the pleasure and privilege of visiting Nicaragua on many occasions since the 1979 overthrow of the Somoza dictatorship. I do know quite a bit about the veterans peace movement, of which I have essentially been part ever since 1968, when I refused army orders to Vietnam and deserted to Sweden and Canada. 
In Stockholm, I joined the American Deserters Committee and spoke loudly against the US war on Vietnam. Later in Toronto, I joined Amex Canada, the US XL Collective and Magazine, fighting for amnesty for all war resistors and veterans with less honorable discharges. So while preparing for today's presentation, I became even more aware of the extent to which US veterans, mostly Vietnam era veterans, have been involved with Nicaragua and Central America, and also how the veterans peace movement has been impacted by our experiences in Nicaragua and Central America. So today I'm gonna to tell these relatively unknown stories of veterans solidarity with the Nicaraguan revolution while at the same time attempting to examine uh, what US intervention in Nicaragua looks like today. I'm so pleased that my longtime friend Gloria Lariva is with us today. Gloria, uh, after I speak, will give a brief report of her recent visit to Nicaragua with an international delegation organized by Nicaragua Network and the Alliance for Global Justice. Gloria is a longtime fighter for peace, solidarity, and socialism. She has recently visited Cuba and Venezuela as well. So the whole uh, troika of tyranny, as John Bolton called them. Uh, Gloria and I will then team up for the Q&A and the discussion. And I want to th thank my uh, partner, Helen Jacquard, for helping me put together this PowerPoint slideshow. This will be the world premiere. And um, I hope you enjoy our presentation. Let me get started here with the share screen and share. Mm -hmm. Okay. We can okay. see it. Great. Is that good? We can see it, yes. Okay, so here we go then. I'm going to have quite a few slides. I don't want to spend too much time in any one of them, but I do have a few stories to tell. Stop moving. Okay, now I got to move. Okay, this is just a little, little background on uh, U.S. intervention in Nicaragua here. And that's some Moses misspelled there, but um, um, there's uh, Augusto Sandino and the Sandino guerrillas who fought against the Marine occupation uh, successfully, um, but uh, Sandino was eventually assassinated um, and uh, the U.S. imposed uh, the Somoza dictatorship beginning in 1936. Um, the Sandinista Front for National Liberation, FSLN, formed in 1961, founded by Carlos Fonseca. There's a poster of his. Carlos Fonseca has died uh, fighting um, in the uh, insurrection that overthrew Somoza. Uh, he's a huge national hero in Nicaragua. Um, and his, interestingly, his son, Carlos Fonseca Terran, is currently the um, FSLN um, minister for, or direct, uh, director for uh, international relations. And yes, the Sandinistas did immediately, coming to power, immediately instituted a, a uh, literacy campaign based on the Cuban model, which was very successful. Um, this is the map that shows uh, in 1987, during the Contra War shows the red areas are where was controlled by the government. The other areas there were still contested by the US backed Contras. Um, the, uh, you need help? Um, I'd like to get, could I get rid of this bar on top? Because no. I can't see my own titles. They're hiding behind that. Is there a way of adjusting? Maybe not. Um, you sure? Can't move it? Okay, you can't see my titles because I got this uh, Google bar and uh, I mean the, the uh, um, Zoom bar on top. I'm trying to fix that. Um, 
maybe I'll just have to endure. Um, okay, so uh, this is uh, in, uh, there was opposition in the US to the Contra War quite a bit. Uh, this is one of the demonstrations that was taking place early on. Uh, we also had what we called pledge resistance for religious and other folks. Pledge to uh, uh, engage in civil disobedience uh, uh, if the U.S. invaded uh, uh, Nicaragua. And there was a lot of concern in Nicaragua about the possibility of a direct military intervention, um, but the U.S. carried out the war, uh, proxy war instead through the U.S.-backed Congress. So um, I'll tell you how I first got working in Washington, D.C. as discussion in the draft uh, work going on in our network, mainly being carried out by Vietnam veterans. And this was... Uh, years before founding of Veterans for Peace. Um, and so uh, suddenly uh, in August of 1983, the Veterans of Foreign Wars had their national convention in New Orleans. And they invited uh, Ronald Reagan to be their guest speaker. And they announced that they were going to donate a million dollars uh, to uh, support the Contras in Nicaragua. Well, my phone started ringing off the wall from angry veterans that the guys represent all the other people in Central America. We have to do something. So what we ended up doing was organizing uh, two veterans delegations Excuse in me, Nicaragua. Jerry? In 1983, Jerry, and Jerry, I, I think we're getting um, some bandwidth problems, and um, it might be better to get off the shared screen. Alan, did you, could you advise yeah. us what to do at this I, point? I believe that he is. I check with another user. There is, I think, on his end, a bandwidth problem. Um, I can share his slides if we take a moment. Uh, I'm trying to think how to do this. If I could get a copy of his slides, do you have them, Roger? No, I don't. And I th think we may have lost Jerry. So um, Jerry, are you there? Um, so let, let me let me suggest that I do this. Um, we're very, very fortunate to have another amazing activist, a long-term um, fighter for ju social justice, Gloria LaRiva on this program as well. Gloria, could you um, give your- Excuse me, excuse me, Roger, I'm here. Oh, you're back here. Okay, yeah. great. And I don't know what happened there. I got kicked off of Zoom. Uh, I hope it doesn't happen again. Um, and I'm looking forward to hearing from Gloria too, but I'd like to proceed with my presentation for now. Absolutely, absolutely Jerry. So um, I, I'd suggest because there's, um, I think some bandwidth problems, if, if um, we do get, get lo, lo, we lose your audio, um, we, mm -hmm. should, we should skip, skip the, the uh, PowerPoint, but, but let's, let's begin with the PowerPoint now and see how it works. Right, well, I could also uh, take myself off video, but then I guess I wouldn't be able to share a screen, would I? Okay. Right. So why don't you just- All right, so, uh, okay, getting back to uh, veterans working in the war zones of Nicaragua. Um, this is uh, the uh, Veterans Peace Action Teams um, founded by um, Brian Wilson and friends. And this is a group of them in Nicaragua. So the purpose of the action teams was the main purpose was to expose and oppose U.S. intervention in Nicaragua, but the method was to work in the war zones um, and uh, to rebuild schools and clinics that had been destroyed by the Contras. This is quite a profound effort um, with, um, um, and here, here they're pictured with Daniel Ortega, that's back in 1987. 
Um, and um, so the, the, these were mostly Vietnam veterans going into an active war zone where you could hear the sounds of war around you and in, in some conditions that could be uh, uh, very similar to Vietnam. So it could be very triggering. So we did like a lot of preparation uh, for these uh, actions, totally committed to nonviolence. And it turned out, among other things, to be a, a wonderful healing experience for many of the combat veterans who participated in it. Um, Brian Wilson is a hero in uh, Nicaragua, and he lives there now. He was responsible for many of the veterans' initiatives there. And uh, here we have a, a, a veterans' peace walk that he initiated um, in 1987, March of 87. I believe it is, and here they are meeting with uh, um, a young Nicaraguan soldier who's been wounded. Um, Brian and several other veterans also initiated the Veterans Fast for Life in Washington, D.C. And here you have George Mizo, Duncan Murphy, Charlie Lickey, Brian Wilson. George and Brian were Vietnam veterans. Duncan is a World War II veteran. Charlie Lickey was a chaplain and a Medal of Honor recipient um, in the Vietnam War. And uh, Brian is the only one who's still alive today. Over here you see George Miso um, with Brian in the background and a bunch of Congress people finally showed up one day. You might recognize some of them. There's John Kerry in the background uh, uh, listening to what they had to say. Okay. Um, Later on um, that year, um, Brian and George went back to Nicaragua and they happened to uh, be there when Eugene Hassenfuss was shot down and captured, um, working for the CIA, uh, um, de delivering uh, weapons illegally uh, and covertly, uh, even away from the eyes of the American public to the Contras in Nicaragua. And they actually, uh, you can see here, actually met him. There's George actually shaking his hand and Brian shaking his head. And um, uh, not long after that, uh, Brian and Duncan and several others sat on the tracks at Concord, uh, California, um, at the Concord Naval Weapons Station, uh, trying to stop a train that was loaded with uh, munitions were going to be loaded onto a ship and sent to Central America. Um, that train didn't stop. It ran over Brian. Brian lost both his legs below the knees. I was present at the time. That's, that's me uh, with my back to the camera. Uh, it was a very uh, horrible situation, but Brian survived and has thrived. Um, okay, this is just a, a uh, one of many, many organizations in the United States that uh, established a solidarity relationship with Nicaragua. Some of them did projects in Nicaragua. There's lots of sister city uh, relationships that were established and many, some of those still thrive today. Um, moving on. Um, and then Veterans for Peace itself was founded in 1985 by veterans who were primarily concerned about US intervention in Nicaragua and Central America. And uh, so that was um, 30, um, 36 years ago, uh, Veterans for Peace has, has thrived and we have over hundred US chapters, over 10 international chapters now and over 3,000 members and growing with a number of younger veterans getting involved and taking leadership at this time. This is our, our statement of purpose, um, in which has served us very well. Um, and I often refer to the, this point here, to restrain our governments from intervening overtly and covertly in the internal affairs of other nations. Um, then in 1988, uh, several of us, including me, was one of the coordinators of the Veterans Peace Convoy to Nicaragua. This is a story, an amazing story that's very little known. Um, so 
there were 104 participants on this convoy. The, um, and 39 vehicles, mainly Toyota trucks, loaded with material aid for Nicaragua. Um, we had a big route coming down the East Coast, another big route coming down the West Coast, converging in Texas and attempting to cross the border into Laredo, from Laredo, Texas, and drive down to Nicaragua. Well, Elliot Abrams was the Secretary of State at the time under the Reagan administration, and he intervened to stop the caravan from leaving the country. First time that a humanitarian aid caravan was blocked from leaving the US. We had a big struggle. We continued to try to cross that border um, and uh, had uh, got our trucks out on blocking the, the, the entrance to the border crossing. Uh, we were attacked by SWAT teams, smashed our windows, sprayed mace in our eyes, pulled us out of the trucks, beat us up, and of course, charged us with assaulting the police. Uh, uh, at, at one point, we then turned our caravan around, drove all the way, way back up to Washington, D.C., and circled the White House and tried to make as much noise as we could there uh, to end the, the, the Contra War against uh, Nicaragua. Um, then we drove back down to the border. We actually went to federal court uh, trying to get an injunction against the illegal order to stop us from crossing the border. But when we went to court, we were able to announce that guess what? All, the vehicle, all our vehicles are now on the Mexican side of the border. We had uh, surreptitiously uh, got them across the border at various points and come together. Then we began to drive through Mexico. Okay, so this is, should be a huge story, right? U.S. veterans challenging U.S. foreign policy being blocked at the U.S. border, by, uh, but you know what? They've got very, very little coverage. It was basically blacked out. I mean, there were a few small items in the New York Times, U.S. Day Today, and elsewhere, but basically uh, it was not much of a story in the U.S. media. However, it was a huge story in all of Latin America. And when people couldn't believe that a bunch of U.S. veterans would take this kind of stand and, and take the punishment they were taking in order to show solidarity uh, with uh, a, a, a struggle in Latin America. So when we drove through Mexico, we were cheered everywhere we went. And even I can even remember driving through Guatemala on almost little dirt roads in some cases out in the middle of the countryside, groups of peasants on the side of the road cheering us still still chokes me up to think about that. And then when we finally arrived in Nicaragua, there were 10,000 people at the border to meet us and people lining all the way from the border, uh, along the border to Managua uh, to, to uh, celebrate what we had done. Quite a remarkable uh, effort. And it was a, a very much a, a, a dramatic turning point for many of us. Oh, that, that button never got in there. Oh, there it is. There's the button from the Bay Area uh, Veterans Peace Convoy. Uh, Paul Cox was one of, one of the people who played a key role in that, many others. Um, and our slogan was feed the children, not the war. You see, I'm trying to go backwards here. Well, there we go. So when we were in Nicaragua, Lucius Walker was also there. Lucius was a radical, Black Baptist preacher, and he had taken a group of uh, religious folks down to Nicaragua to witness what was going on there. And they were on a boat headed for the Atlantic coast when they were ambushed by the Contras. One Nicaraguan man was killed and, and Lucius Walker was shot um, in the butt, and, uh, but it was a serious injury. And uh, we went to visit him in the hospital there in Managua and at that point, he was inspired by the Veterans Peace Convoy. He said, well, I'm going to now organize a religious caravan to Nicaragua. And um, he actually hired uh, one of our key staff people, Tom Hansen, uh, to, to coordinate the logistics for that next caravan. 
and that was the birth of IFCO Pastors for Peace, uh, which as many of you know, has done caravans to Nicaragua, El Salvador, Guatemala, Chiapas, and many French shipment caravans continuing to Cuba. Lucius passed a few years ago as well. Okay, this is a slide actually from an article by Dan Kovalik of, uh, after his recent um, um, visit to Nicaragua with the Nicaragua Network delegation. And uh, these are people who were actually victims of the uh, attempted coup in 2018. This guy was, was tortured so badly he lost one of his arms. Um, and you'll hear more about that later. Um, so when I was, I, I actually went to Nicaragua with a Veterans for Peace delegation two years ago this month. Well, actually in July, we're August 1st today. So this is a, a, a meeting with police uh, and families of, of widows of police who had been who were killed because there were actually 24, 22 or 24 police were killed uh, during that, uh, what, what some people call attempted coup, um, but during the, the violence that was instigated in, in April through June of 2018. Um, so these are people holding up the photos of some of the police who were killed. And we met not only with the widows, who were, of course, very, very distressed, but also there were people there who'd been seriously injured, disabled, and blinded even um, by uh, the conflict. And what we learned from talking to quite a few people was there were about 260 people killed in that violence. Over half of them were Sandinistas or Sandinista supporters, including these police, uh, some of whom had been kidnapped, tortured, and killed. Um, so, uh, the, 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 and yet the, this, the, the narrative in the mass media and even bought into by some of our progressive friends is that the Daniel Ortega government uh, brutally attacked uh, nonviolent uh, demonstrators and killed 300 of them. It's not true. Okay, um, we met with the, uh, when I was there two years ago, we met with the uh, historic combatants. Um, and they um, gave us this wonderful, my internet connection is stable, how unstable it's here. I hope it's gonna hold. Or to overthrow Somoza and those who fought um, in the war against the Contras. And uh, um, many of them were high ranking colonels and generals who really directed the, the, the wars. Uh, that, that we were able to meet with. Um, they are straight, incredibly highly respected in urban society. Dismantling the, the barricades uh, that had been set up uh, to paralyze uh, Nicaraguan commerce and terrorize the population. Um, they, they, they gave the Veterans for Peace delegation this wonderful banner, which is actually behind me on my wall here. It says, uh, uh, for those who don't read Spanish, it's uh, brother veterans of war, those of us who've, who've lived war want peace. To work, to advance, to fight, to win, always lead. Let's go forward to more victories. And that was the, for the 40th anniversary 2019. So a beautiful gesture on their part. Um, we met with uh, Daniel Ortega when we were there. Uh, and uh, there he is with uh, uh, Chris Smiley, our geographer and activist, uh, wearing a Veterans for Peace hat. Um, and it was very interesting. Here's, uh, um, here's our delegation meeting with Ortega. Um, that's Ann Wright standing next to him, and a bunch of our veterans, Maurice Martin down here, um, Colleen Littlejohn, who is our Nicaragua Network coordinator in Nicaragua. Um, it was very interesting uh, meeting with Ortega because we, we sat down and he immediately pulled out a book that had been um, pilfered 
from the um, Library of Congress. And it was uh, from the late 1800s. And it was a book uh, with a lot of engineering data and other data uh, estimates about the possibility of a uh, canal being built across Nicaragua from the Atlantic to the Pacific. Um, and there's lots of, or lots of maps that would unfold off the pages and stuff. And it was a quite a, and he was making the point that I think, and he did say it, he or someone else told us, he said, well, we don't have oil in Nicaragua, but we do have the possibility of building a canal which could compete with the, the Panama, the US controlled Panama Canal. Um, and uh, the US has long had an interest in that possibility. If there, if there is gonna be a, a, a Nicaragua canal, the US wants to control it. Uh, otherwise, they want to stop it. So he implied that this is a major uh, reason, aside from the threat of a good example, that uh, that goes through uh, the whole string of U.S. motivation for intervention there. So we went to the uh, we celebrated the 40th anniversary of the revolution. This was two years ago, and uh, uh, there were 400,000 people there. Um, in this square who traveled, many of them who traveled from around, all around Nicaragua. And it was, jubilant. I mean, it was a party and an incredible display of support for the revolution and the government. Uh, here's Maurice Martin and myself. Maurice is uh, flashing a peace sign to the crowd. Um, that's another closer shot of the, of the crowd there celebrating this young woman holding up both the FSLN flag and the Nicaraguan flag. The opposition has kind of tried to make the Nicaraguan flag their own. Um, but uh, there's another crowd shot. I mean, there really were uh, 400,000 people densely packed into this place. And this is not any way, any way, by any means, a picture of the whole crowd. Okay. And I were there. Um, actually, the Veterans for Peace were given a seat on the podium. That's why we have all these good photos. And that, these are the Sandinista youth behind us. And uh, I got to join the Sandinista youth for a while. I love this shot. Um, so yeah, Nicaragua uh, uh, arguably poses the biggest threat is that threat of a good example. And here's some of the uh, accomplishments that have, have been uh, achieved during uh, the last 13 years during which the Ortega government has been back in power after, after 17 years out of power. Of course, of course, the U.S. used the Contra War and the U.S. and sanctions to uh, put all of Nicaragua under incredible stress in the 1980s. And then they um, totally manipulated the 1990 election. They forged an alliance. They forced all the opposition parties uh, to come and support one candidate. They financed a large part of that campaign. They did uh, all kinds of media work. They had and then, you know, in, 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 Central, in, in Latin America, U.S. imperialism is not very subtle. So the U.S. ambassador just held a press conference in Managua and said, you know, if you vote for the Sandinistas, the war is going to continue, the sanctions are, are going to continue. Um, so, uh, but, and so they actually managed to uh, uh, defeat the Sandinistas, which was quite a shock to many of us. Uh, we were totally expecting the Sandinistas to win that election. Um, and even though um, it had been stacked against them, Daniel Ortega and the Sandinistas, to their credit, um, handed over power. It was the first um, peaceful transfer of power in Nicaragua's history. And then they were out of power for 17 years, where neoliberal governments ran the country into the ground, reversed all the accomplishments of, of the revolution, and uh, had you know terrific corruption, privatization, etc. What you would expect, um, but in the 13 years that the, the Sandinistas have been back in the saddle, 
They have, have free quality health care. Um, they have free education. Poverty has been drastically reduced from 48% to 24%. Extreme poverty from 17.5% to 6.9%. Electricity has been increased from 54% of the population to 99% of the population. And 26 to 85%, that's a pretty big range, of electricity is from renewables. Oh, it, started, it used to be 26, now it's 85% of their electricity is from renew, renewables. Uh, six, uh, 92% of the population now have potable drink, drinking water. Um, um, there's been great investments in the Caribbean coast uh, to bring up the um, autonomous region there of indigenous Nicaraguans and Afro-Caribbean, uh, uh, Afro-Nicaraguans communities. Uh, affordable housing, agriculture, micro lending to women, subsidies for low income, transportation, pensions, energy, women's equality. There's a, a recent international survey that uh, actually ranked Nicaragua fifth in the world in gender equality after four Scandinavian countries. Pretty amazing. And on top of that, uh, the US, Nicaragua recently passed a law requiring the uh, parties to submit to uh, 50 percent women candidates. Um, some of the opposition parties aren't too happy about that one. Um, food, food security has been uh, greatly achieved. Uh, 90 percent of, the, of their food is now grown in Nicaragua, uh, which is a big advantage for them, especially facing uh, U.S. Uh, uh, economic warfare. Um, okay, so what do I have here? These are just uh, uh, just a, rec uh, a uh, reminder that we need to recognize and resist U.S. intervention, and in the various ways that's happening in all these countries and more. Um, these are actions that uh, people can take. Um, well, first of all, I just want to say. Um, in conclusion, it's uh, really unfortunate and disturbing that some progressive intellectuals and former Nicaragua solidarity activists have inadvertently joined in the demonization of Nicaragua's most popular leader at a time when the U.S. is working overtime to de delegitimize the Nicaragua election. Um, I'm going to give the benefit of the doubt uh, that those who signed the recent letter condemning uh, Nicarag uh, Nicaraguan President Ortega did not have the full picture. They were misled by U.S. regime change propaganda and that they acted with good intentions. We need to, we need to uh, win these folks over with accurate information and a strong anti-imperialist orientation. All the polls show the Sandinistas winning the next election handily along with high approval ratings for the government of Daniel Ortega. Some of those who were recently arrested had earlier expressed interest in running for president, but none of them were being seriously considered by any of the parties. So this line that he's arrested his, his uh, opposition presidential candidates is actually not true. Uh, and they were certainly not arrested because they might become candidates. They've been charged with serious crimes for which they would be prosecuted in almost any country receiving millions of dollars from a foreign government, a hostile government at that, without reporting it, accounting for it, how it's being spent, or registering as a foreign agent, as now required under Nicaraguan law, just as in US law. Um, money laundering, calling for additional sanctions against their own country. One of them even called for US military intervention. Others were involved in coordinating the violent attempted coup in 2018. Nicaragua has the right and the responsibility to defend its sovereignty against U.S. intervention and any collaborators in Nicaragua. Daniel Ortega has been in power for a long time, so he has certainly acquired many enemies, including in power struggles within his own party. He's probably made mistakes along the way, perhaps some serious mistakes. I don't know. Some of the accusations against him may be justified. However, Ortega is presiding over a government which is making dramatic improvements in the lives of everyday Nicaraguans. 
What kind of government would replace the Sandinistas? There are no progressive parties or candidates running against the Sandinistas, no socialists. What you would have would be another conservative government with neoliberal economic policies, doing the bidding of the United States, undoing the gains of the Nicaraguan revolution and privatizing everything they could get their hands on. This would be a huge setback for the Nicaraguan people and really for all of Latin America and a huge victory for US imperialism. It's critically important that the US peace movement recognize and resist US intervention in Nicaragua throughout Latin America and in many other countries. And that we think twice before we start screaming about alleged human rights abuse charges against governments that are in the crosshairs of US imperialism. Thank you. Oh, thank, uh, thank you, Jer what, Jerry. And, and, uh, and I just finally, wanted to add, finally, Jerry, finally, if, if I could just say a, a word here. Um, sure. If you maybe end the screen sh um, share. Um, okay. our, our, after Gloria speaks, we'll have some announcements for, from the library, and then we'll have a robust question and answer period where everybody will get the chance to give a two minute either question or comment and it'll we'll have an opportunity from both Jerry and Gloria to respond. Uh, th thank you, Jerry. And, and I think you, you have the mic now. Oh, no. Uh, um, I'm, I've finished my presentation. And I'm uh, very happy that I'm going to be followed by Gloria, who was just in uh, Nicaragua, and I'm sure, as well as Cuba and Venezuela, and I'm sure she'll have some important information and perspectives to share. Are you with us, Gloria? Hope you haven't lost Gloria. No, I'm, <clears throat> I'm here. Okay. Um, should okay, I start? Great. Please. Hey, Susan, how you doing? Susan Lagos, we just saw each other in Nicaragua. I want to put my little timer because I don't want to go on and on. It's really great to see everybody here, people I know and people I don't know. And it is very timely that this forum is happening on Nicaragua because although it's quiet right now, you can bet that in Washington and Langley, Virginia, that the U.S. government is planning to delegitimize and carry out whatever plot to do what they try to do with President Maduro in Venezuela after he was elected with this campaign with Juan Guaido. <clears throat> we don't know what, kind, what form that aggression will take, but it's certain to happen. When John Bolton named this so-called troika of tyranny and named Cuba, Venezuela, and Nicaragua, that aggression has not slowed down. In fact, it's intensified during the Biden administration. And I want to say, <clears throat> I'm so glad to hear you, Jerry. That was an extremely important history that young people, all the great number of young activists who are involved now, have no idea the history of the Nicaraguan Revolution and the Contra War and everything in terms of the, your veterans and other people's support for the revolution. So I think that what you produce, uh, it ought to be, go out much further. <clears throat> um, I would say that while the media attacks against all three countries I mentioned as dictatorships and repression, that I believe Daniel Ortega is the most demonized as an individual. And unfortunately, as Jerry said, a good number of liberal slash progressives are on an aggressive offensive against him. I've, I've seen that here in the Bay Area. People have approached me and said, you've got to take a stand. And when we say, well, you know, the U.S. is, is uh, involved in this, they go, we don't care. It's an exception. This time it's different. And it isn't different. But that's not the impression that I got in Nicaragua. <clears throat> I've never traveled there before. I've been to many other Latin American countries, but never Central America. And Nicaragua was my first trip for this week with the Alliance for Global Justice with Dan Kovalik, a young Mexican activist with the Alliance named Eduardo, a Brazilian journalist, Netva Freeman from the Black Alliance for Peace and others. And the thing I really saw was peace 
in the streets of Nicaragua. And no fear of like, watch it, we have to have security. That's a very telling thing. Because even in Venezuela, with a revolutionary government and the resistance of the population, although there's a great number of opposition because the wealthy class is still there, um, you can't really do openly what people do in Nicaragua, carrying the FSLN flags, a very visible support in society. And <clears throat> that's not possible when you have an openly violent or unstable situation as they have portrayed it. it. I was very, very impressed. And I think that um, under the pretext, as Jerry was stating about the 2018 election, what I saw here and what we saw here in the movement about the demonstrations of young people protesting social security changes, which was to, to make the social security and pensions viable in the future because Nicaragua, like Cuba, in many countries, the population is aging. And so naturally it has to be reformed. And I thought, first of all, at that time in 2018, what are young people doing protesting social security? They don't care about those things till they get older. For That should have been a clue. And one of the things that I saw from that violence, and I, w I was shocked at how deep the violence was, um, even though reading about it, was when we traveled to Messiah in our delegation where about half the town had been taken over by these military gangs for over two months. I think the response by the government, the police forces, is very, very revealing and a complete um, rejection of this claim of repression by the police and the state and how they treated it. And we met with three men. They were, they were men who were working simply as security over the property of the Messiah city government at a plant for sanitation trucks, heavy equipment for road building and repair. In short, the, the equipment for running a city was being held and they were attacked by these gangs in April. To make a long story short, as Jerry said, they were beaten and one man of the three that we met, his arm, he lost his arm. And if there's time, if anyone's interested, I have a six minute video that I did of one of the people who is a longtime resident. He's, he's from uh, Great Britain, I, forget, I, I don't know, John Perry. <laughs> you will know where he's from, Susan. But it's a very, very informative interview, quite good, where he describes what it was like. Now. What surprised me was hearing that, that the government ordered the police when this violence broke out that lasted till July and where people were killed, that the government ordered the police to stay in their headquarters and not to come out and engage the terrorists, which ended up being the right thing to do. First of all, because if there had been engagement, the gangs would have fired because they're just like in Cuba, they're told attack the police to show police response and then it's portrayed as repression. And so that didn't happen for over two months until they finally came in as these terrorists declared Messiah to be independent, then they took action. But people were certainly injured. And the second effect of it was that the population, which at first seemed favorable, rejected them because they saw how much had been destroyed. The city market and Mercado, very historic place where many small, tiny businesses are, where people sell their handicrafts to make a living. It was completely burned down. There were many institutions burned down in the city of Messiah. So anyway, that I think that was the most important thing for people to know, that in fact, the government held back on what would have been a justified response they were arrested, but then they were given amnesty. Some of them were convicted in the violence, but they were given amnesty in the idea of this reconciliation and uh, con reconciliation of the government. Now they're back, many of them carrying out plans that will probably unfold before November. The thing that I personally experienced with interviews with Nicaraguan people 
whether in casual conversation in the street or with educators in public school or a training facility. We met with a doctor talking about the COVID response and how the medical health system is. Or a longtime leader in the afro Nicaraguan uh, indigenous community in Bluefields is the comparison that people gave us with their life under the neoliberal governments of Chamorro, of Aleman and Bolaños. Imagine, that was like 17 years that the Sandinistas had stepped back and accepted the defeat and let them run the government. And that government showed the people what life was like, a privatization, water, the schools, healthcare. And that's why Ortega was elected the first time at 38%, 68% the second time, and 72% the last election, right? 2016 with five opposition candidates. Um, so what, what we have to do is counter this disinformation campaign, directed, financed, coordinated, and thought up in the Pentagon and the CIA. It, it comes from them because it's a pattern around the world, wherever the U.S. wants to overthrow a government. We have a lot of work to do because not many people know about the history of Nicaragua. I'm talking about young people. And even Americans who lived that time, we lived under Reagan, right? We had a great time with Brian Wilson. I've known of Brian Wilson. I've exchanged a couple of the emails over the years from a distance. We were there at the protests at the rails after he had been mauled in that assault on him by the government. But we, I had never been able to share time with him. And he's truly, truly happy in Nicaragua. He feels he's, he's bonded with the historic combatants of the Nicaraguan revolution. He's going on tour with them now to talk to the communities. We had a press conference at the end of our trip. There were several media there and we were featured in the evening news of one station. Um, and, and also in the social, me social media, Twitter and so on. But again, I just want to emphasize that the November elections are coming up and will be a serious challenge to the movement. I, I think that the people who are in the movement historically and who now have turned against the government, I think they know better. Maybe there's some who are confused. And a lot of people are saying, we're hearing from leftists or former leftists. What do we think about this? And I think that Jill Clark, I think it is, Golub, has written an excellent expose of what the issue of the arrest of these so-called pre-candidates is about. They're, they're naming themselves pre-candidates as if to say that their right to run in the election and the electoral repression is happening right now. On, on July 18, when people welcome the 12 midnight, July 19th anniversary of the revolution. We were there and it was so amazing to see the youth. The youth are very, very involved in supporting the revolution. Now, that was a visible part and we didn't spend tons of time in Nicaragua, but I have to say I was very impressed and I'll, I'll end it there, but I do have this six and a half minute, a video of John Perry who hosted us when we went to Messiah to meet with and hear the men who so courageously, the ones who were beaten, kidnapped, who were protecting the infrastructure of the city of Messiah, that they were being beaten because the terrorists were demanding that they tell them the address of where the mayor lived. And they said openly, we're going to kill him and put it on social media. And they, they possibly sacrificed their lives. They could have died, and one policeman did die. And that's the kind of courage and resistance that is in the Nicaraguan people. And before I end, I want to say I was in Cuba. I was in Venezuela this summer. And, of course, we saw this explosion of small, small protests on July 11 against Cuba and the response of the Cuban people the next Saturday. And this is definitely... The Biden administration now taking up the policy of Trump. They're now Biden's policy. 
And he said on Friday in adding more sanctions that this is not over. I believe the U.S. believes this is the time to do in the Cuban revolution. So our work is there. Cuba will not fall, but Cuba is suffering because of the blockade and the pandemic. So thank you. I will stop. Thank you very much, Gloria. Thank you, Jerry. Incredibly important and well done presentation. Um, we'll have some announcements right now about the library. Jean, can you tell us a little bit about future programs at the library? Eugene Rohl, unmute yourself and tell us about the future programs. Jean, right. unmute oh, yourself. Okay, I'm unmuted now, right? Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much. This has been a real treat for me. Uh, uh, two of my favorite people representing two of my favorite organizations, Veterans for Peace and the Party for Socialism and Liberation. Uh, this is great. We are honored that we're able to host this. And I want to say is, you know, I've been in academia all my life and I really appreciate that you people are giving us something to talk about, something worthwhile put in our classes. So we're really indebted to you and thank you so much. Uh, we have some other good pro, we're gonna try to follow this up with some other good programs. Next week, our speaker will be Elazar Friedman, who will discuss the imperative need to develop a Leninist united front to combat the menace of fascist and white supremacist attacks in today's uh, US. And I think most of you know uh, Elazar. He's been on our program many times, and this should also be a very interesting and worthwhile program. And then following that, uh, the following week, I believe we're going to have Harry Tang, uh, who is with the Committees for Correspondence and uh, Socialism, um, speaking on a something on ide ideology. We're not entirely clear yet. But I want to thank Norma, at least, for setting that up, and we will try to firm that up. Uh, we also have Tony Ryan, who is with the library. He's going to be speaking on, uh, on Cuba. So that, that should be excellent also. And then uh, I talked to our, our friend and colleague, uh, Sharat Lin, uh, who um, will be speaking, want, wants to give a talk on an undisclosed topic yet, and we're working on that. So we have some excellent programs coming up, and really, uh, but really, uh, they're going to have a hard job uh, following you guys. This was great. Thank you so much. Thank okay, you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Gene. And in a moment, we'll get to the question and answer. But Richard Fallenbaum, did you want to give us a little background or a little pitch on um, finances? Richard Fallenbaum. You're muted. Okay, thank you. Yes, um, uh, uh, the Institute for the Critical Studies of Society has small expenses, so we need some money. And we're also helping the Niebuhr Proctor Marxist Library survive. So uh, I posted... Um, uh, and we get all our all our funds are from um, from individuals uh, who who participate and attend our programs. Uh, so I posted on the um, uh, chat some information on how you can contribute. Um, I prefer receiving it through PayPal; it's the most convenient. But we can also receive through a check, through the mail, or through Patreon. Uh, which would allow you to give a set up a, a recurring contribution. So please con consider contrib contributing to um, ICSS. So thank thank back you, to Richard. You, Roger. Thank you, thank you, Richard. So now, now we'll have the Q and A. Um, to be recognized, you can raise your hand using the reactions. I believe the reactions um, button will give you a hands up, um, or you could just raise your hand. Unfortunately, oh, fortunately, there are so many people on the program that even in gallery view, I can't see everybody. So um, if I don't see your hand. Um, uh, Send me a chat, Roger Harris, um, and then then we can um, get you get you in on the queue. Um, I right now don't see any hands, but we'll, 
each Richard person w. will have two Richard minutes. W. Richard Alan? W. Take a look at the participants window. Richard W. has his hand up. Okay. Um, I will look look in, look in that, and then um, we'll have two. It, it will be just two minutes. We'll have to be disciplined about that. Of course, we have a lot of people and a lot of comments and and questions to cover. And Alan, could could you do the um, timing for us, please? Yeah, yeah. I, I'll be timing. Take uh, work off the participants window. You'll be able to see hands that are raised. Okay. Um, I Richard is first. And then Dan Shea. I still don't see that yet. Um, I'm in gallery view, and you're saying no, no. Should, just go to the participants window, Roger. Hit, the, hit bottom, the not the not the. Uh, yeah, hit the participants at the bottom. That'll give you the window, up on the side, and then you can see it. Um, I'm not on the bottom. That. You see the button that says at the bottom. It, it says, says participants. It says participants. Yeah, like that. hit that. I hit that, but it doesn't give me hands. Uh, I just, um, yeah, see the hands. You must be full screen. I think you have to go to less than full screen. Get out of full screen. I'll go to speaker anyway. view. Um, it gives you a list of okay, names, I'll, and I'll to the call. right of the name, there's a, a hand, a yellow hand, showing up. Okay, then I'll, I'll just have to scroll through that. Um, okay, no, so the Richard, hands are going to be on top. The people who have raised their hands are going to be on top of your list. Um, they are. When when I go to participants window, I get all fifty participants right now, but right. I don't get any hands. Um, hmm. Right now, right um, under Raj, there's Richard W. and Dave, David Shea, and they are sorted by the raised hands. Okay, Alan, I'm I'm going to ask you um, okay. Okay, to mo to moderate because I'm not I'll, seeing I'll the hands. Okay, why don't we start with Richard W. followed by Daniel Shea. So, Richard, if you'll unmute yourself and go ahead and ask your yeah. question. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Great. Um, I wanted to thank Jerry for a, a very nice presentation. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to sort of preface my remarks by. Uh, um, I happened to watch uh, Born on Fourth of July uh, yesterday, uh, the Ron Kovic um, uh, picture, and it seems to me that we've been Bally, we've been raising our heroes as the people who, very, very, I being one of them. I went to the Navy for four years, and it's very easy to sit there and sign up and and, and raise your hand and then do do your four years. It's much harder to protest. By uh, by either going to jail or to uh, or, or to uh, uh, go to another country, and I think that those are the real heroes, uh, not the people like myself that just uh, went in uh, uh, for. Uh. Anyways, uh, I went down to Nicaragua under the auspices of Technica um, the second week of uh, following President Reagan's uh, re-election, mm -hmm. um, and uh, I'm sort of an an unusual position because about the same time that I was there, um, as near as we can tell, uh, special forces um, apparently lost, we don't really know at this point, lost his leg uh, training uh, the Contras. Uh, and, and as I said, in a manner consistent with a, with a landmine. Uh, and I was up in the I was up in the northern parts of uh, of Nicaragua uh, visiting an agricultural mechanical school up there, uh, where they sent out guards at night. And uh, um, and and to be honest with you, when I was there, I, I was uh, I was in in, in uh, uh, um, uh, the thing I was most impressed with is that the the revolution really benefited. Uh, the, the the agricultural workers and their fan and, and 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 basically the future. Uh, we got tours of of, uh, of living conditions uh, 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 for the uh, for the peasants. And had I not had I not gotten out of uh, 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 Managua, I would have been pretty disappointed uh, because so many of those people got sent to uh, so many of the, the progeny uh, that they uh, got sent to. Uh, to Mexico for, for education and then came back after the revolution. Um, 
And so I and and fine. So uh, I I've seen vast improvements, you know, from education for healthcare, uh, and I, I you know it's just amazing. In spite of of all the efforts that have gone into, uh, you know, from our end, keeping those kinds of uh, repressions, okay, those um, uh, pro progressions from happening. Anyways, uh, that's my just my comment. And, and if you want to uh, uh, comment on that, I appreciate it. Thank you. Jerry, or thanks, Richard. Uh, I, I I think we'll just uh, thanks for the comment. Uh, I don't think I need to respond to that right now. Let's go on with uh, Dan Shea. Hi um, again. Um, my name is Daniel Shea. I'm a longtime uh, member of Veterans for Peace. I have been on delegations to uh, Cuba in '94 and Venezuela uh, and during a. Um, uh, uh, World Social Forum back in, uh, what was it, uh, 2006. Um, and then uh, um, with Jerry, I think it was uh, 2018, 19, Jerry, uh, 19. to Venezuela. Yeah, to, uh, 19 to, uh, with uh, Jerry and uh, other uh, delegates to during a one of those um, uh, blackouts uh, where even our plane could land by uh, radar and uh, had to uh, land by sight. It was like going back uh, to Vietnam for me, uh, where planes were having to come in and out under fire. Uh, but at this time, we did get in. We finally got in, and uh, uh, the the city was was uh, at night was totally blacked out. And from the media in the United States, all we heard was that people were rising up, and that there was. Uh, uh, so much discontent in the streets and rioting going on. We're in the middle of it, and none of that was happening. It was a out and out lie. What happened is that people were actually coming together, helping each other, like in any disaster uh, that you see in this country, where people may not get along politically, but they came together to help each other. Uh, elderly stuck in uh, in tenth floor of a hotel couldn't get down for food or water. Uh, people ran up to them, took care of them. The young people came together to help them. So you, you get this sense that oftentimes what we hear is lying. Well, I live in Portland, Oregon. That's the home of uh, Ben Linder, who was assassinated in, by the Contras um, <clears throat> in, in, uh, during the Contra War. And I was uh, involved in the sanctuary movement where people were fleeing from uh, the wars there uh, in in. Uh, El Salvador and Nicaragua and Guatemala to this to the United States and hearing the the horrors of war and being one who had experienced it himself uh, there was a whole movement of veterans and other people that were actively involved in participating and and objecting to those wars in those countries and Jerry is a close friend and it was an excellent job of, um, of this presentation um, and I want to thank uh, Gloria also uh, they both gave excellent presentations, but I have, people have questions. You mentioned the police, you know, here in this country, we don't, we don't care for the police because they're attacking uh, uh, human rights activists, Black Lives Matter protests. So when we talk about the police in Nicaragua, and you're talking about, you know, uh, them showing up that they, they're as widows, et cetera, uh, how are the police different there? And how many women are police in that country? Jerry, can you answer that? Or Gloria, either one of you? Thank you. Well, I can say in general, my understanding is that they're the, the most nonviolent police in Central America. Um, and that uh, you can see when you're there that uh, people are not afraid of the police. They're very approachable. Um, so um, I think that... Uh, and as uh, Gloria said earlier, um, I think the police were uh, did respond to s initially to some of the the black the, the barricades and and uh, violence that was going on. But then uh, Daniel Ortega wisely pulled them off the streets back into the barracks um, so that they would minimize the violent conflict. Um, the military also did not get involved. 
uh, beyond securing uh, certain uh, places in the country so that they would not come under attack. Uh, so uh, uh, I think that, uh, uh, you know, there's no death squads in Nicaragua and you don't have people being disappeared. Um, and uh, the police are, I think, uh, to a large extent, model police. That, uh, somebody else might have more to say about that. Okay, thank you, thank you, Jerry. Um, I, I'll I'd like to back. say something really quickly, and you know, the, it's the same narrative that we're hearing about Cuba and the Cuban police in respect to what took place on July 11. And I've had, I've been to Cuba 100 times, 105 times since 85, and I've had many encounters where I've seen the police in action in all kinds of situations. And in, the, in a revolutionary society, the, we're so used to the government, our government being the enemy. I mean, I think it is because of what it does to the people in, in all aspects, an enemy of the people of the world. But that's the role of the police is to uphold capital and you know, uphold um, the system. And, and in Cuba, the police are very peaceful. Uh, I think that there was a lot of uh, false media, literally false media. There's this famous video or infamous video right now of a woman screaming on July 11 that her husband was massacred. He was killed. There's blood on the floor. Her child was in the house. The cops come in and she's very violent looking. Well, it's completely false. It did not happen. And it's being shown that, that it didn't happen. And the neighbor, there's a Canadian woman who, has family there, was there that day and said, we know that woman. And it was totally made up. Um, that's what they're doing. That's what they're doing with the portrayal of the Nicaraguan police and the Venezuelan police. The, the people sanctioned in Cuba on Friday by Biden are the heads of the police. And what they did in 2015, when Obama declared Venezuela a extraordinary national security risk to the United States was because the National Guard uh, youth, which are very young people, the soldiers, they were defending against these terrorists that were carrying out violent attacks, killing people in the city of Caracas. And I was at the bridge in 2019, February, <clears throat> between Colombia and Venezuela all day in the midst of the tear gas and the National Guard youth for, for almost 20 or more than 24 hours standing with only their shields to um, defend against these terrorists throwing Molotov cocktails. Eight of them were burned. And the reason I say this is because the U.S. imposed more sanctions on the state security forces, the National Guard. Three Democrat congresswomen, including, um, I can't remember, name them all right now, Wasserman Schmidt, Three congressmen from the Democrats passed and got a measure against Venezuela that they couldn't import any more tear gas from many countries, like blockade tear gas, so they couldn't defend themselves against terrorism. The U.S. is attacking the security forces of those three countries. And of course, they're going to portray them as repressive. Coming from the mouth of Washington, and the United States, which kills a thousand black and Latino youth in the United States every year, that's, you gotta take that with a, with a major grain of salt. Thank, thank you, Gloria. Um, uh, right now in the stack, we have Yusef, followed by Jean, followed by Raj, followed by Will Van Nata, and followed by is Vara Pedmore. So, um, Yusef, you're on. Unmute yourself and please comment or question. Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, you, Yusef, uh, your video, your audio is is weak. Uh, how is it now? It's still too too weak. If he, if he uh, goes off video, he might have better sound. No, uh, the same. Uh, 
I, I think if he shouts and makes it uh, short, <laughs> it might work. Yusef, do you want to give that a try? I think I think we lost we lost Yusef. Are you still there, Yusef? Um, uh, how about now? Now there. it's perfect. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I want to emphasize we must thank the speaker for taking the so-called Latin America, which is really the Americas, with the U.S. and Canada accepted uh, as a whole. Um, my second point uh, uh, that I'd like uh, feedback from uh, is that um, uh, with the, I think it, 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 the peace uh, movement is facing a crisis and has faced the crisis uh, since Yugoslavia. Uh, and that solidarity and uh, uh, a class struggle are being replaced by helter skelter applauding any protest uh, and uh, uh, reviving uh, 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 obsolete utopian notions of, of the 19th century. Uh, and I think it, 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 the, there is a systemic uh, problem in the uh, peace movement today, which, we might, which people like us uh, must overcome. And I'd like to uh, hear um, the feedback on that. Maybe, maybe Roger, there could be a two or three questions. Okay. Uh, um, if your questions, and then you, you, you want to go, uh, Jerry? Are you okay with that? So, okay, let's oh, let's go on, down to uh, Gene Rule. Um, Gene, you're on, please. Okay. Would you put me back on the stack? I can't talk right now, but uh, okay. Then Raj, um, uh, yeah. Sai, so, so hi, yeah. please. You're on. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So my question is to both Jerry and to Gloria. Uh, about Cuba, that is, I guess, directed at Gloria, I understand Cuba has developed a very effective vaccine against COVID, I mean, to prevent COVID, and yet it has problem because of sanctions on needles, uh, and that was preventing uh, its being able to sufficiently aggressively vaccinate and uh, so what do you know about it? Uh, and, uh, and the other question is to both, which is, I know that uh, R Russia under Putin uh, wrote off the uh, loans uh, to Cuba, which came from USSR. And, and was, is there some economic assistance from either Russia or China to both Nicaragua and uh, Cuba under these uh, sanction both countries are under the boot of U.S. imperialism. Are they helping in any way? So, I can't you, tell you the particulars on that. I know that uh, uh, Nicaragua has trade relations with many countries around the world, um, including even Taiwan and Israel. Um, and they receive aid from many uh, countries around the world. And I assume that uh, that includes uh, Russia. I think there's been some Chinese investment in, in Nicaragua as there has been throughout Latin America, but I can't, uh, I can't really say more than that. Maybe Gloria can, maybe someone else here. Well, I can say something quickly about Cuba. Um, Cuba in all of last year had maybe 200 plus people who had died of COVID. They had a an, an, an very strong shutdown, uh, and it was very hard for the economy. They lost almost all their tourism by having to stop any, in, in, uh, any flights coming in from tourists. So 2019, they had 4.5 million tourists. 2020, they had 1 million. And this year, in six months, they had 125,000 people. It's a giant loss of income. Uh, in March 2020, as of pandemic hit the world, Brazil expelled thousands of Cuban doctors and Cuba lost hundreds of millions of dollars in income to help finance their health system. Mm 
Mm-hmm. And now <clears throat> there's been a major outbreak in COVID cases. When I was there in June, it was a thousand a day, which was shocking to people. And then about three weeks later, it grew to 3,000 a day. And then in early July, it was more than 6,500 a day for about a week. Uh, now it's been sadly over 8,000. And then two days ago, it was 9,000 cases a day, which is oh my God. very shocking. So now from about 200 and something people who died in 2020, 20, almost 2,500 people have died. Uh, in Matanzas, where half the cases are, Matanzas is a tourist area, and there was some in, influx of some tourists. Um, the sad thing was, if you read this Canadian reporter, her name is Catherine Guerrera, and you can look it up. It's an excellent article. I think everyone should read it because it shows what was really going on the day of the protest. She was there and belies all this media lie. Anyway, she says that in Matanzas, where it was a um, focus on, on um, vaccinating people, they ran out of needles because Cuba's blockaded. This blockade is fierce. And so people were turned away. But now, as of this morning, President Diaz Canel reported that now 49, 49% of the people of the Mantanzas province have received their third shot, which is over 90% effective of a Cuban vaccine. Why did Cuba produce five vaccines? Because as I said, in the very beginning, they knew they would not get support, that the U.S. would blockade vaccines as they've tried to blockade syringes. So a national, international campaign has brought what will be from the U.S. six million syringes, and hopefully things will start to look up. Mm-hmm. But that's why yeah. the U.S. decided this is a time to do Cuba in. Mm-hmm. And uh, by the way, uh, Mexico and Nicaragua uh, mm-hmm. are both sending shiploads of aid to Cuba at this very moment. Yeah, and also I think the most important thing about Mexico is that President Lopez Obrador. I think this is historic actually, but it's part of what Mexico has done in its long going, ongoing friendship with Cuba from the beginning, is that Lopez Obrador called for the dissolution of the Organization of American States. That's very bold for, from one of the most important countries of Latin America. And he also declared that the UN, UNESCO should, should name the Cuban people as a patrimony of humanity as they do with cultural things, right? For its resistance to the US blockade all these years. That's so important. Thank you. Okay, on the um, stack right now is Will, followed by is Vera, followed by Jean. So Will, take Will, it away, you please. Turn on your um, audio in Zoom. You don't, you don't have a microphone. Go ahead, Will. I don't see any microphone. Uh, active. You need to turn on your microphone from Zoom in your, where it says mute the up arrow. If not, then I think we need to go on to Isvara, I'm afraid. Thank you, Alan. Mm -hmm. I don't see uh, any audio connection at all. He should get a connection when he logs on. He Uh, might have to get out and log back on. we're, We're on top of it. Okay, I'm going to go to... Okay, keep working on that, Will. Uh, uh, you might have okay, to go log on, off and log back on. Is Vera, please, and then um, I'll call on Will if, um, if you can get that connection going. So, it, it, is, uh, Vera, if Thank you could you. take it away, please. Can you hear me? Absolutely great. Thank you so much. Fantastic presentation, clear moving. I'm from Chile, so you understand what I'm talking about. And um, I was, this, this was such a good presentation. I would love to be able to see it again. Do you publish in YouTube or somewhere where? Yes, it will be uh, on YouTube. Under what uh, tag or what is the name of the organization that I should look for? It'll be the initials ICSS Marxist. If you Google that. I, I, C, S, 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 Marxist. 
Marxist. Okay, thank you so much, and thank you for a fantastic present. Mm -hmm. I got, I got by a miracle uh, the link to this uh, presentation from Wilf here in Palo Alto. I live in Stanford, but I'm not a Stanford person. I'm a wife, so <laughs> um, <laughs> I wanted to uh, continue in touch with you people, and I, I had no idea. So I'll, I'll, at least I checked the videos. Thank you so much. Thank you. That's uh, all. No, Roger, okay. I, see that, I see that Will has a microphone now. And uh, you do have your jeans ready, too. So, Will, um, uh, can you uh, take it away, please? Unmute yourself, Will. Unmute. Lower left hand corner, unmute. Wow, well, should we? Damn. That's a shame. Okay, oh, well. so then let, let me go on to Jean, and then hopefully we'll come back. We'll we'll come back, and then anybody else who wants to be on the stack, please raise your hand or let me know um, by saying "stack" in the chat, please. No, I'm good. Jean, you're you're on. Okay, well, well, this is really great, and I just wonder uh, if the U.S. would be doing this to Nicaragua if they if the Nicaragua had nuclear weapons. Because the reason, you know, I don't follow, uh, I can't follow Latin America as closely as, uh, as I would like, but I do try to follow China. And there's been a very significant interaction between, I think, this woman Sherman, as number two in the State Department, and her Chinese counterpart. And I really think people ought to read, that. there's a Google translation of the comments and discussion on that. But, you know, basically, uh, the Chinese just read the riot act to this woman saying, you will, tr you will treat us as equals. And we understand that your quote of uh, so-called values are in fact a cover for trying to deny the Chinese people their right to self-development and so forth. I mean, it's very powerful and it's very encouraging to me to see a socialist, a communist country able to stand up to the evil empire that we have here. And I think we're seeing a major change and mm -hmm. uh, which will benefit uh, all of the socialist countries, Cuba, Venezuela, Nicaragua and, and all. But I just wanted to make that comment and see uh, what your reaction is on that. Thank you. Well, Eugene, I'm sure you're not suggesting that Nicaragua get nuclear weapons, uh, but uh, your point is well taken. I think you know, it's interesting, I, I found out fairly recently that the entire Latin America from the US-Mexico border all, all the way down to the tip, of, uh, southern tip of South America is uh, one huge nuclear free zone. Um, and uh, many of the uh, Latin American countries signed uh, on uh, at the UN General Assembly for the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons. Honduras of all countries was the 50th country to ratify that uh, treaty and therefore have it go into effect earlier this year. Uh, so we want to see a lot fewer nukes around the world um, um, rather than uh, <laughs> suggest that anybody should acquire them for their self-defense. Fine. Glory, I, do you want to comment or should, should, can we go on to the next speaker? No, let's go on. Okay, I think Will is back on uh, microphone. So Will Van Natha, please. Un okay, there you are. Whoops. He's it unmuted. I see him. We're not getting any sound from him, apparently. He was... Okay, the the next person on stack is um, Anne Wright, and then we'll we'll get back. We'll, we will get back to Will. So Anne Wright, um, pl please go. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you again for a great program uh, by both Jerry and Gloria. Uh, I was with Jerry in 2019 on the Veterans for Peace uh, trip to Nicaragua. Uh, I have a very interesting background. I was part of the U.S. government for most of my adult life, including my very first assignment, which was with the Foreign Service in Nicaragua in the last days of the, uh, well, it turned out the last two years the Sandinistas were in power the first time. So I, I was part of uh, 
you know, the U.S. government's role in uh, uh, what was done to Nicaragua, for which I apologize profusely and trying to make up for it. I resigned from the government in 2003 in opposition to the war in Iraq, a little bit late, but, you know, you try to make up for what you can. Um, certainly, the, uh, what, what the U.S. is doing right now to Nicaragua parallels exactly what was going on from 1987 to 1989, <clears throat> uh, which led to the election of uh, Violeta Chamorro. Uh, the numbers of parties, political parties that were funded by the United States that were funded out of the CIA in Miami, same old thing, NED, uh, Republican National Institute, all of those paying off uh, NGOs in, in Nicaragua now and paying off, I can guarantee you, those uh, people who are saying that they're political candidates. It follows exactly what happened in 1988 and 89. Uh, the, the, you know, the challenge of the Sandinista government or the government of Nicaragua is how to balance uh, what they're trying to do in protecting the gains that they've done uh, uh, against people that are trying to overthrow them in the US government. But certainly the international media is going after them just as they did in 1988 and 89. So with that, I just uh, apologize again for my role in what happened to Nicaragua uh, back 30 years ago. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I think you've more than made up for it by now, Anne, but keep on going. <laughs> okay, um, I, I, think, I think we'll um, we'll give it another chance. We'll, uh, if you can unmute yourself now and make sure he's unmuted. Um, we'll, why don't you um, go? Uh, it looks like he's continuing to have technical problems. He got dropped, he got dropped Roger. He got dropped. Okay. Um, I don't see anybody else on the stack. I'd like to see some more hands coming up. But let me ask um, a question to Jerry and Gloria. Um, one of the big controversial issues that have um, been with Nicaragua has related to the um, Trans-Ocean Canal. And we did have a comment in the chat about the Trans-Ocean Canal. Um, can, um, would either of you like to address that issue? Jerry? Well, it's, I think it's on hold right now, um, and uh, it's been controversial. There's uh, uh, some uh, uh, perhaps le probably legitimate environmental concerns have been raised by some Nicaraguans. Uh, it's also been a uh, convenient focus of attack against the or Ortega government. Um, it's, uh, there's, I don't have any current information. I mean, I think that... Uh, Daniel Ortega said, uh, you know, geopolitical conditions may change sometime in the future. Perhaps uh, there'll be a, um, a, a canal across Nicaragua. Uh, in the meantime, though, a lot of uh, infrastructure improvements have been made, which uh, including uh, they're now going to be building a, a, a <laughs> deep water port at Bluefields on the Atlantic coast, which would be a first. Um, and they have the now the, the beautiful highways that connect all of the country used to take the better part of three days to travel from Managua to Bluefields on the Atlantic coast. Now you can drive it in six hours. Um, so uh, 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 there's an overland infrastructure for transferring goods from one coast to the other. It could come into play. And uh, maybe someday in the future, there will be a, 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 another attempt to uh, build a canal, but as I said, it's even uh, the uh, potential for that canal, whether or not it's built, that has been a key concern of U.S. imperialism from the very beginning. Gloria, do you, you want to comment? To yeah, I think <clears throat> the, the canal in the Nicaragua situation or the oil development exploration in Ecuador were part of the U.S. attack on saying that indigenous people were affected and trying to split, you know, the U.S. is really great at trying to create a divide and conquer. 
And so they gave, they gave, gave great voice to the opposition, to the canal. The Panama Canal is strategic to the U.S. It's why Omar Torrijos was assassinated in his plane crash and why they reversed this great treaty that gave Panama the canal back. And, and the U.S. Would, would be dead set against the canal in Nicaragua because it would give the country such economic independence. It, it would be very important. Certainly there's environmental concerns, but isn't that the case in the whole world? Um, anyway, now I want to say one thing. We had a very, very informative interview with a man, a, a significant leader in the Bluefields community, Afro indigenous, um, Baldock is his name. I don't, I don't have his last name. I had to listen to my video. I took a lot of video while I was there, but he spoke about the, um, his, the historic difference between the development of that community and the rest of Nicaragua and how these seemingly incongruent parts of the country became one. And yet he told us at one point, he said, Daniel Ortega of all the Sandinista leadership was the only one who really supported the indigenous and Afro Nicaraguan community of Bluefields. And it has led to a formal recognition and granting of autonomy to almost a third of the territory of the country, which I think has brought about not only peace, but uh, a stability and, and support for the government. And that's something people don't know. We just remember what happened in the 80s with the US fomenting and, and helping mm -hmm. create a division in the, among the mosquitoes. Mm -hmm. And also trying to foster that in the American Indian movement in the United States. Yeah. But he said more than once, he goes, Ortega was the only one who supported us. Th thank you, Gloria. Um, we now have three people on the stack, but I'm going to call on myself just very, very briefly also, um, Laura, because I wanted to comment Roger, on uh, Laura, Laura Wells. Pardon me? Laura Wells. No, no, I, I see the stack. I'm fine. Um, and I'm going to call <laughs> on myself very, very briefly to speak on the, on the canal because I'm, I'm with a um, human rights group called the Task Force on the Americas. And we've been around for about, well, since 1985. So, so we have long roots in Central America. And I was remiss to say that we're very happy that Jerry Kindland is now on our board of directors as well. And we um, discussed at quite length the issue of the canal. And there were a lot of pros and cons, but we decided that as solidarity activists, that our position was that the Nicaraguans have to make that decision, that it's not the decision of North Americans, however well-meaning we are, uh, but it's not our decision on how a country chooses to develop it itself, that we have to recognize that Nicaragua is a sovereign country and that the United States is not this exceptional, perfect place that can pass judgment about what is correct for other countries to do. So I wanted to add that um, on the stack is Laura Wells, Richard W., and then Daniel, back to Daniel Shea. Laura, can you um, ask your question, please? Um, yeah, I, I had a question in the chat, and I'm not sure whether the answer came through yet, but Gloria, you mentioned a journalist who had written a good uh, piece about Cuba. And if you could tell me what that is, that's one question. Another is that um, I'm curious, well, I, I went to Nicaragua in March and it was just exactly as, as Gloria was describing and Jerry, um, how different it is when you're there compared to what you think it's going to be based on the mainstream media, but not just the mainstream media. I have a question. In Democracy Now!, I forget when it was, but Camilo uh, Mejia was debating the grandson of Daniel Ellsberg. Um, and I'm sort of wondering, where is Daniel Ellsberg's grandson coming from um, opposing Ortega? And also, what happened with, uh, what's her name, Dora Maria Tellez, um, who was in the documentary, called Las Sandinistas, which was a, a hit piece about Ortega. And so I'm just curious about how, how they 
uh, changed over time. And, and thank you so much for, for uh, both Jerry and Gloria for what you had to say. Thanks. If I may, Roger, quickly, <clears throat> Laura, nice to hear you. I put in the chat the link to the article that's called Eyewitness Account of U.S. Attempts to Destabilize Cuba. Her name is Catherine Guerrera. She wrote for, I think, People's Voice. I don't have the link to that. This is the article with her original link. And so it's in there. It's on our website. And I'm sorry I don't have the original, but it's what I could access that quickly. Thank you. Yeah, and Laura, I can't really uh, comment uh, on um, Ellsberg. Uh, El Ellsberg was one of the signers of the, of the letter uh, condemning uh, uh, Ortega's recent uh, arrests, et cetera. Um, and uh, uh, apparently he was probably, among other things, influenced by his, uh, is it a, is a, is it a uh, son or a grandson um, who's uh, working in, in Nicaragua. You know, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of former uh, solidarity activists and even maybe current solidarity activists who have maintained long relationships with certain NGOs that are now compromised, I would say. And, uh, and they have long relationships with individuals uh, who have become uh, estranged from uh, Daniel Ortega and the Ortega government. Uh, so, I mean, I think that's the basis in part is actually personal connections uh, that do exist and, uh, and, and relationships with NGOs that have now, you know, been compromised by receiving money from USAID and NED and others, um, and and it ended up playing a role, kind of cheerleading uh, for the uh, attempted coup in in, in 2018. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's, I'm sure there's a lot of complicated uh, history there. Uh, as far as Dora Maria Tellez, I, I she has been she's one of those arrested. She's you know a, a historically a, a heroine of the of the revolution. Um, and uh, a lot of people are concerned about that. I believe she was charged with offenses having to do with coordinating the uh, uh, violent uh, takeover of Messiah. Uh, so she's been estranged from, uh, from, uh, from uh, Ortega and from the Sandinista Front for many years. And I should point out that, uh, you know, from the beginning, there were serious class differences and different class interests in, in within Nicaragua, and that's maybe appropriate for a Marxist forum here. You had uh, Daniel Ortega representing more of the working class and concerned about the peasants, uh, and uh, you had people who were like actually uh, uh, children of the oligarchs, who uh, they didn't necessarily want socialism or anything close to it in Nicaragua. They wanted a piece of the pie. Uh, Somoza was hogging everything for himself and his family. So, uh, you know, the, the, the original directorate of the Sandinistas with nine people, three each from three different factions. So there were built in contradictions from the very beginning. Some of those played out in various power struggles over the years. Um, but some of the people who were uh, considered the heroes of the revolution have actually become enemies of the revolution. Okay, th and I thank think, you. I think when some of these are are openly financed by the U.S. government, that's not a naive thing. They they know what would happen anywhere in the world, and in our history of the U.S. knows what would happen if the U.S. can overthrow a revolution, a progressive government for whatever reason, they will destroy whoever was upholding it. And and it. You know, it's like Jerry said, revolutions are not pure. And the whole, the forces that come in, I mean, that happened in Cuba, that happened in Venezuela, it's happening now in Nicaragua. And Fidel Castro has a great quote where he says, in the hard times, when you're being challenged, people fall away, they, be, they become weak, they give up, they betray. <clears throat> and then there are those who are tested and resist and stay strong. Thank you. And next, next on the stack is Richard W. Followed by um, 
Trajan and then Daniel Shea. The, the, the way we do that is um, if you've already spoken, you go to the bottom of the stack and then the people who haven't spoken get it, a chance to speak the first time. So Richard W. from the uh, Lone Star State. Yeah, really. <laughs> I'm so lonely down here. Um, I, I know when I was there, uh, uh, the uh, National Endowment for Democracy had just been passed, and uh, the, the U.S. government was was actively involved, uh, although surreptitiously, uh, in supporting the uh, I think it was uh, the Shamaro uh, newspaper for one, uh, and and it was you know they 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 understood very clearly that that the U.S. was uh, was trying to get its mitts uh, you know to create dissent. My question had to do more with the Bluefields. Um, and, and I think the Bluefields, uh, uh, if I remember, I, maybe my geography is wrong, but uh, if, if I remember, the Bluefields are in the, uh, the northeast corner of Nicaragua. Uh, and if I, if I remember correctly, that was the site of the Ray Contra yeah, movement. As soon as this guy speaks, I got it. I'm sorry? No, oh. they can't see it. Don't say anything. Um, my, my question is, I guess, Talk in a minute. Are, are there any, are there any signs of, um, of any, uh, any, any more Ray Contra activity, um, in that area? Thank you. I could try to answer that. Well, first of all, Bluefield is not really in the Northeast. Um, uh, Billy is in the Northeast and that's more of an indigenous area. And that was an, an area uh, where there was initially some um, conflict between the, the incoming Sandinistas who had just defeated Somoza and, and, and indigenous, uh, armed indigenous groups, some of whom were uh, encouraged and financed by the CIA. Um, I haven't heard of uh, any uh, contra activity in any of those areas. Uh, however, I would say that the uh, the attempted coup in 2018 involved uh, Contras. And some of the cities, you know, we, we, we met with people in Esteli and Lyon and other, other cities that had, were all, there was a coordinated, this was a well-planned, well-coordinated effort. It was not a spontaneous uh, demonstration. Um, and some of those uh, folks that, that attacked the city halls were armed with AK-47s. As well as mortars, both homemade and 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 uh, manufactured. Um, so uh, that was a. Uh, I mean, I think this is a to some extent an extension of the Contras, uh, but I have not heard of any uh, any uh, other uh, armed efforts or attempts to take over any regions of Nicaragua. Okay. Th thank. Thank you. Um, I, I think um, Trajan, maybe you you're on now. Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Perfectly. Yes. Thank you. Um, yeah, I put in chat. There was a question about has Russia sent any aid? I put in chat. It was an RT article. They had sent uh, a couple of plane loads of masks and food to help out Cuba during the crisis. And uh, I've been trying to find articles on China. This is an opportune time for China since they got a big economy and It'd be a very good opportune time for them to step in and help Ch uh, Cuba out. I haven't been able to find too much on it, uh, but I know in the past China has donated bicycles several years ago to Cuba. Uh, there was a Breitbart article I did find. I put that on chat. I don't try. I don't trust Breitbart news, but again, I just hope that China steps up because uh, they could really help. Cuba out, and they should, since they are a socialist country. That's my comment. Thank you. Jerry or um, Gloria? Well, yeah, of course, we would encourage uh, solidarity and aid from uh, um, progressive governments and individuals all over the world. And I assume that uh, uh, that China is uh, providing some aid and some investment in, in uh, Nicaragua, but I don't have any more information about that. You know, at, uh, at the height of the 
first uh, wave of the COVID last year, China sent plane loads of aid to 50 countries. And the one country that the U.S. blocked the shipment from going to Cuba was Cuba. The U.S. blocked it. How how they keep China from doing that? Because they sanctioned the plane. They would, that's why the U.S. is successfully blockaded all the oil that comes from Venezuela by threatening the ships with losing their insurance. I mean, I think we're in a phase right now with the U.S. financial power is as great and they're, they're using it everywhere to, to just cut off countries and especially Cuba and Venezuela. They stole in Venezuela's oil and gold. And, um, but isn't it amazing that China tried to send aid to Cuba at one point and was blocked out of 50 countries? They have sent since then through other means. Thank you, Gloria. Um, Daniel, can, can you um, comment it or speak if, you, if you'd like, please? Yes, thank you. Um, I have two questions. One is, Jerry, you mentioned uh, uh, Three hundred killed uh, during the uh, so-called attempted coup, um, and uh, I think when we're talking to people in general, uh, they 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 believe that you said that was a lie. But I think people need an explanation. Um, and uh, uh, could you talk more about that? Uh, second question is: um, oftentimes we're hearing about these younger people coming in and and imposing these uh, uh, socialist leaders uh, when, and, and almost calling for the U.S. or at least giving language to the U.S.'s language that, to, uh, uh, for re regime change. And, uh, and I've heard it called the color revolution. Uh, could you explain, uh, both you or Gloria, um, uh, what the color revolutions mean and who they are and what, it, what it's about? Thank you. Okay, I'll take the first part and leave the second part for Gloria. Um, well, um, my understanding from talking to a lot of uh, sources in Nicaragua is that 260 people were killed. So there were there, there were a lot of people did die. Uh, the question is, where was the violence coming from? Uh, and it's been portrayed uh, wrongly that uh, the Nicaraguan government and police uh, gunned down in cold blood 300 nonviolent protesters. No, what in fact was a violent um, situation was set up. People came with arms. Uh, people sought out Sandinista leaders in some communities, burned down their houses, kidnapped them, tortured them, and in some cases killed them. Uh, there was conflict at the barricades. So they, they set up barricades all over the country, which uh, some of them probably thought was uh, cute because that was one of the tactics uh, the insurrection against the paper of Arakata. Um, but uh, brought commerce to a standstill. Actually, they caused about $2 billion in losses uh, to uh, the Nicaraguan economy and terrorized communities, people afraid to leave their homes, including Brian Wilson in, in Granada, uh, for, uh, for a couple months. Um, you know, and they had paid thugs man, manning these barricades. So initially some Sandinista supporters uh, spontaneously came out and fought back. Uh, so there was, there was uh, some fighting uh, pro and con and the people had uh, weapons. Um, and initially the police were involved. Of course, there was also a big lie. And one thing that hasn't been mentioned in this hybrid warfare was the, was the use of social media to uh, spread lies. And this was something that the US had been funding and training uh, certain people to learn how to use the social media in a situation like this. So the big lie that was first told was that the police had gunned down two or three people and killed people on the very first day. It turned out to be a total lie, but it was all over social media in Nicaragua. And a lot of people believed it. Even some Sandinista supporters believed it. And Sandinista came out in the streets until they learned that it was a, was a big lie and saw what was going on. Um, so, uh, uh, yeah, so a lot of people died, as I pointed out before, 24 of them were actually sending these to police. Um, 
and uh, uh, it was some serious violence. It was promoted, uh, organized, and planned uh, by uh, the U.S. and uh, and Contras Contra type forces in Nicaragua. And there were some people that got caught up in the middle of it as well, confused about what was going on. Um, and uh, basically, that's that's what happened. Um, so, uh, as I said, over half of those 260, approximately 260 deaths, were actually Sandinistas and Sandinista supporters. I'd like to say something that also goes back to, I think, the first question, if I may, Roger, the first question about the, the concern of the anti-war movement and the weakness and anti-imperialist understanding. And I would say that the challenge for us is to understand who our audience is. First, the American people, because we live here in this American po U.S. policy. But breaking it down, there is the progressive movement you know, a lot of older people like ourselves who lived through the history of Nicaragua, who understood what it was then, because Reagan was such a clear, uh, it was, you know, he, it was the beginning of kind of the end. It was the beginning of these years of, of increased aggression. And the collapse of the Soviet Union, that had a big effect in the world. So... I think we have to share among ourselves and tell our friends and the colleagues we know, those who are confused, we have, among all of us, we have a large circle of people, is to use the resources we have. The Alliance for Global Justice has great, great resources on Nicaragua. It used to be the Nicaragua Network. Um, the Task Force on the Americas as well. I think it's a wonderful newsletter. And even if you live in Texas or somewhere else, we can subscribe to these. There's the progressive media. I just put missionverdad.com. There's, there's a, a wealth of, act, of things. And the newspaper I write for, liberationnews.org. And I have to produce a lot of material on this trip. <clears throat> but anyway, it's there. Uh, I will put up in this next minute the link to this great article by uh, Jill Clark Col Golub countering all the, a lot of these lies. So we, but the other, the other part is the, the youth movement, all the people coming into action, motion. And I think we need to, our task, I think, is to reach to people who don't think of Nicaragua, but they're gonna they're gonna, it's going to be blown in their faces when they're told, you don't know much geography, but now the next country to worry about that we should go after, we, we meaning they want to draw us into it, is Nicaragua. And so when there is actions about other anti-war or Black Lives Matter, anything that there's mo movement, let's, let's, bring, let's inject the international issue as well. Because people do want to know, like, if you have a chance to speak, why are we spending billions of dollars to bring down countries that provide health care and free education, like the three, the Troika, why is the U.S. spending all that money when we're suffering here at home with trillion-dollar debt of the students and um, how many millions facing eviction now? Today or yesterday, today, be, today is the end of the moratorium on evictions. So that's all I want to say is we have to think about how to reach to our people. Can I say something? Uh, very good point, Gloria. And I would just add, I, I appreciate uh, that you have AF org. That's where the Nika notes are. Um, and uh, there's also several free ebooks you can download there. Okay. Um, I think Nina Wax wanted to say something. Oh, uh, yeah. I, I just wanted to add that uh, regarding uh, moratorium eviction, um, the city of Oakland, as I understand it, uh, has its own moratorium. And so uh, I think that's in effect on, on evictions. Okay, so thank you. Um, I think we've gotten to the um, hour of 12.30, and usually what we do on these library presentations is that we kind of open it up so we don't have a formal moderated uh, discussion, but people can just um, chime in. Of course, the same rules of decorum and civility are, are um, expected, but um, this part is now unmoderated, and um, um, hopefully that Jerry and 
Gloria, who have been um, very, very articulate and helpful. Institute for the Critical Study of Society at the Niebuhr Propter Marxist Library receives no corporate funding, nor do we have any paid staff. We rely on the support of working class folks that share our commitment to the socialist legacy of Karl Marx. We continue to need funds to meet necessary expenses. Since we can no longer pass the hat, at our in-person forums, please send contributions to our treasurer either online via PayPal or by check. The PayPal ID is ICSS Sunday S U N D A Y at yahoo.com, and the name is Richard Fallenbaum. And checks may be made out to Richard Fallenbaum and sent to him at 1225 Nielsen Street, Berkeley, California, 94706. Fallenbaum is spelled F-A-L-L-E-N-B-A-U-M. To donate directly to the Marxist Library, send a check to the Niebuhr Proctor Marxist Library at 6501 Telegraph Avenue. Oakland, California, 94609, or di directly or donate online at www.paypal.me slash npml. Info for information, write to, to npml at marxistlibr.org, and the website is Marxist L.